is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are getting you set for the 2020 Kentucky Derby at Churchill Downs that is coming up this Saturday. Yes, it's in September and not May this year. We're going to break it all down with Megan Devine. She's going to give her thoughts on this year's field, her general horse racing process, and more, and also her favorite picks for the Kentucky Derby. My name is Jim Sadis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as always, by Ed Feng. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com. Ed, Derby Day coming up on Saturday, overlapping with the NBA playoffs. So it feels like May if we get those two at the same time. We can just convince ourselves that's the case, right? That's right. I mean, I just want to I, I just want to do this podcast like Marcus Smart shot three-pointers last night. <laughs> He went nuts in the fourth quarter. He uh, he hit one, and I was like, huh, that's interesting. I wonder if, he, if his three-point shooting percentage has gotten better. You look up the numbers, and yeah, it's pretty good. He hits like 34 35%, which is still below NBA average. He hits another one, and I'm, and I'm telling my nine-year-old, he's like, yeah, well, you know, he's still a below average NBA shooter. Yeah. He hits three more in a row, so he hit five in a row, and like by the end, like me and my nine-year-old are both like cheering every time he like <laughs> So that was fun, a little small. He, my, and my son was like, yeah, well, it, it's working, right? I was like, no, no, yeah. we got to talk about small sample size, buddy. No, no, heat check. <laughs> Lean fully into it. Lean into the, you know, if it's if it ain't broke, just keep on firing away and see what happens. That's right. So I want to be like Marcus Smart, but hopefully I, I'm a, you know, not a below average uh, podcast co-host. I hope so. we shoot better than 35%. Like, you know, just a, a general, like maybe we don't, I don't know. But like, I would hope we do. 35%'s okay, right? 35% is good, but the NBA average is, you know, yeah. 36, 36 so point something. If so. we can get to 38% on our on our podcast efficiency percentage, I'll feel pretty good about that. Uh, but it's nice to have uh, NBA back. Obviously, last time we recorded the podcast and like a couple hours later, the NBA went on strike. So yep. uh, weird how quickly things change. So we're talking about this here today. I don't know what news is going to break immediately after we record this podcast. Like, is the Big Ten magically going to be back by the time we're done talking here today? I feel like, you know, with the way things are going, you never know. Like, I'm trying to predict what the next big thing is that's going to ruin the timeliness of our podcast. It happens every week, it seems like. Yeah, it does. Um, I don't know. I mean, there, there's so much going on in the world when you have the president talking to the Big Ten commissioner. Yeah. And not the president of a university, president no. of the country. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you just never know what's going to happen. I mean, from what I've read, I mean, it seems like a November start date, you know, yeah. it's kind of interesting, like play right through the winter, find some indoor arenas where you could do that. I, I don't know. That kind of makes a lot of sense to me, maybe. So we'll see. I mean, the kids are kids are back on campus here in Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. That's been, uh, you know, <laughs> you drive by campus and you got like 10 dudes playing pickup basketball without a mask. Yeah. I'm like, can't you guys just go for a run to get your exercise? Come on. <laughs> just just for a couple months. Just go run. Yeah. Running's great. You can wear a mask while playing pickup basketball pretty easily. Just do that. Yeah. Wear a mask. I, Put on I'm a mask. I'm not sure that's a good idea, but they, yeah. they certainly weren't 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 doing that. I mean it's just it's just the duration of contact you're around so many people. Right. So um well, yeah, I think college, the colleges need to get past this next couple of weeks. Hopefully, maybe a few of them will actually keep their kids on campus for a while. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we can see how a college football season goes for the six conferences that have decided to play this fall. And then maybe the Big Ten and Pac-12 will follow suit in November. I don't know. I, I no idea what's going to happen. Again, like I'm, I'm not opposed to extending football season just like from a viewer perspective. Like if we can get two Rose Bowls out of this there are worse things to me than than getting that so i think right. that um whatever they decide hopefully it's based on medical evidence versus public pressure you know whatever they decide if they do it based on that i am good with it i would just like them to pick something because the constant back and forth in indecision is is a little maddening i think that's that's where i'm at right now yeah for sure but i mean i mean there's there's no certainty in the world right now so 
Yeah, that's true. So got to change as you get in additional information. We're going to talk about that as well with Megan Devine. She is our guest for today, previewing the Kentucky Derby from Churchill Downs. Uh, this is, I think... The second time we've had an on-site person, we had Dr. Eric Eager from the Super Bowl. Now we got Megan Devine from Churchill Downs. So she will join us here on the podcast to preview the 2020 Kentucky Derby. You can find Megan on Twitter at Megan Devine TV. She is a horse racing host and reporter for TVG and also uh, the Horse Racing Happy Hour podcast, which is also on the radio in Louisville, but you can find it in podcast form on Apple. There is a link to the podcast in the show notes here for today on numberfire.com if you want to find that and get additional thoughts from Megan there. We're going to preview Saturday's Kentucky Derby, talk about the impact of the schedule change on the horses, the way that may impact betting, whether you should go with Tis the Law as a favorite or potentially have a little bit more fun with a longer shot as well. Megan also owns uh, her own company. It's called Vidhorse. You can find them on Twitter at Vidhorse and pretty cool videos of like like kind of like GoPros on horses. So I don't know if that's the best way to describe it, but you can find on Twitter at VidHorse to check that out and find Megan on Twitter at Megan Divine TV. We'll get back into the NFL next week to get you set for week number one. But if you want some more NFL thoughts, last week we had Chris Raybon of the Action Network on to discuss player props and transitioning into betting from playing fantasy football. Aaron Schatz joined us from Football Outsiders to talk about the Football Outsiders Football Almanac and also their DVOA projections, talk about some playoff odds, and we had Orlando Skandrick on the impact of the lack of preseason games on what we could see early on in the season. So make sure you check those out by searching for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts, and check out uh, Raybon, check out Shots, and ch check out Orlando Skandrick as well to get their thoughts. And also, while you're there, if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as well. Football is back, and FanDuel is giving you a new way to play fantasy football this season with its best ball contests. Unlike standard season-long fantasy football, where you have to constantly make changes to your starting lineup and roster, you only have to focus on one thing and one thing only, the draft. All you have to do is draft a 20-player team, and you're done. Each week, your top-scoring players automatically start and will count toward your season total. The team with the most points at the end of the season wins. No setting your lineup, no waivers, no trades, just draft. It is that easy, and it's the easiest way to play season-long fantasy football. For more details, it's FanDuel.com or download the FanDuel app today. Eligibility restrictions apply. Let's talk to Megan Devine now to get us set for the 2020 Kentucky Derby. Once again, she is a horse racing host and reporter for TVG. You can find her on the Horse Racing Happy Hour podcast as well and find her on Twitter at Megan Devine TV. Let's head up to Churchill Downs now and get you set for the 2020 Kentucky Derby. Covering the present. Let's bring Megan Devine into covering the spread to get us set for the 2020 Kentucky Derby, and she's coming live from Churchill Downs. So, Megan, this is awesome. How are you doing today? Hey, guys. I'm doing really well. Uh, enjoying my time here in Kentucky under the Twin Spires. I've got a, a little safe office that I'm in by myself, so I, that's why I'm not wearing a mask while we're on this together. But uh, it's been really fun to be here to watch all the Derby horses and Oaks horses train, of course, leading up to the uh, first Saturday in September, which feels really weird to say. <laughs> yeah, it's strange yeah. to have this new schedule that we have here and the way that things have worked out. What has it been like at Churchill Downs? Like, is how different is the atmosphere in 2020 versus all the other years? Well, one of the things that I, I love, and I, I know many people do as well, is just the everyone on the backstretch during Derby Week. I mean, it's just alive with, with spirit and personality and excitement. And, you know, you've got all sorts of different tents with vendors and news stations and, and everything you can imagine. And so it's uh, tough to not have that. I know the locals really, really appreciate the mornings here, as does every, anybody else that's able to make it in. So it's been a little bit of a bummer um, to not have that. It's eerily quiet in that way and uh, certainly there's a lot of different protocols that you have to go through to to get through and everything's been really safe here at churchill downs and you know i i think everybody's happy so far with given the conditions but uh still i'm, I'm blessed to be one of the ones that gets to lay eyes on the horses in the mornings as we prepare for the derby absolutely and what does that do for you like you know how much insight do you get from actually being at the track and being around everyone as far mm -hmm. as formulating your analysis on things Tons, tons. I mean, my background is as a rider. So I grew up riding horses since the age of seven, um, mostly jumpers, the jumping horses, but I also galloped race horses for a little while and I've been around them for quite a few years. So for me, you obviously have to dig into the stats as you do with the past performances or any other supplemental tools that you use for your handicapping. But in my opinion, there's 
you know, nothing that beats actually putting your eyes on a horse and be able to see how they're doing. Many horses don't handle different tracks well. So you could have a horse that's very successful, say in California, that doesn't ship over to the Midwest or New York and do as well. So to see how they're covering the actual surface that they're going to race on is really important. And some horses just don't travel that well. I mean, that's like people too. You have people that are really comfortable in their own <laughs> homes or their own spaces, but you know, you take them out of that, you make them go on a trip or travel or work somewhere else and they don't perform to their best. So it's really important, I think, to to get that analysis and to be able to see it. And especially with, you know, Tiz the Law being the heavy favorite, you have to try to find some reason to come up with another horse to like if you're looking to make money. So I think it's really, really important to see how they're working over the surface. Do you feel like you have an edge uh, as far as an analysis perspective because your background is as a rider? Because I feel like a lot of people have backgrounds in horse riding, but maybe not that specific background. Do you feel like that gives you an advantage given the additional background you have on all this? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Big advantage. <laughs> no, it is. It's a big advantage. And it's something that as an analyst as well on TVG, you know, I try to to relay that to the public and really try to explain it as well. It's one of those things that's really hard to put into words because you do have to have that experience to a certain extent and to understand and, and try to develop your eye. But that's something that you can't read off of the paper and it does take time to kind of see it just like any other sport, any other expert in any sport. So it helps me and I try to help the public out with it too. And if there's something that I can see, like a little intricacy of say a horse's ears, you know, moving a certain way and, and listening to things or a rider maybe having pressure on one rein more so than another for a horse that's trying to, to get out in a workout or something that happens in a race, all of that stuff you don't necessarily see and you can't read it. So to have somebody like myself or be able to talk to jockeys or trainers or, you know, horsemen, if you will, um, I think is really important. So I love bringing that to the table as an analyst. So you said you've been doing this since you were seven. What initially yeah. <laughs> got you into horse racing? I have no idea. I, I mean, my family... <laughs> I'm, I'm very much like the black sheep. A lot of people in racing, their families were in it, you know, their father was the trainer or whatever else. No one in my family had anything to do with horses. And I'm from New York, like I'm from Long Island. Where would I grow up with that? I didn't grow up in the rolling bluegrass hills or anything. So um, I don't know. I just always loved it as a kid. I, I loved the pony rides, the carousels. And my mom finally got me uh, riding lessons. And I started at like a little rinky dink barn uh, that was nearby to where I grew up. So I just always had an affinity for it. Was bit by the bug really early and, and had that carry me through. Ended up in, in Louisville, Kentucky to go to college of all places from New York. I think my college guidance counselor was like, where are you going? And do they wear shoes? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so uh, it was it was cool to be here and, and be in horse country. And, and that kind of took off from there with my career. That's awesome. So Megan, yeah. you told us a lot about how you uh, look at the horses to, to get an edge and definitely want to ask you about that in terms of the Kentucky Derby a little bit later. But tell us a little bit about how you use uh, past results in your analysis as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, that's, that's the first thing that you want to go to. You have to see, of course, what are the conditions of the race, we call it. So is it a long race, a short race, um, you know, a dirt race, a turf race, those four things, synthetic as well, surfaces, it, it all is very different. You can think of it in the same way as people, like an Olympic sprinter is going to look a lot different than somebody that's going to run the New York Marathon. So if, if you can kind of see, okay, what are we looking at here? And what should I look for in the horses? And then you dig into the past performances for have they gone this distance before? Class is really important as well. We have different levels of racing. Um, so to be able to understand that and know if they're moving up to tougher competition or maybe, you know, dropping down to easier competition that might give them an edge is, is very helpful. Uh, and then pace of the race too. Horses like to you know, have certain spots sometimes. So horses like to be on the front end or maybe a horse like Zenyatta, if you know that name, you know, to come from behind and, and make a really exciting finish. Um, it, it all is very dependent on, on what you have in the makeup of each race. So a race that has a lot of front speed, you look for a horse that's going to come from off the pace. Or if the, if the race rather doesn't have a lot of um, early speed, then the horses that come from behind are, are not going to have as much of a chance to, to catch up on them because there'll be soft fractions, soft times on the front end with horses just saving their energy. So those, I think, are the first things that I look at when I'm looking at the form. And that's all right there uh, for you to right. read and, and whatever you use to get past performances. So that's pretty cool. So, I mean, I usually can, we, can I think about it in terms of milers, because like there's milers that are fast and then there's milers that are strong. And so mm -hmm. like these horses that are like going to come up late in the race, they're kind of like the strength horses. They're going to yeah. tend to have more endurance. Is that kind of the way to think about it? 
Yeah, I think so. Um, it, it's just they, I think, lend them, give themselves a little bit more vulnerability sometimes because they are so dependent on the front end horses if they're going to be fast or not. But they're definitely strong horses that are able to have quick acceleration at the end of a race and, and save their energy until then and still be competitive as well. I mean, they still have to be in touch with the rest of the field. You can't come sure. from completely off the screen. Some do, but not often. Um, but yeah, I, I, you could think of it in the way of, of strength and speed. So you were talking about all the different factors that are in play. Let's talk specifically about this weekend for the Kentucky Derby. For people who haven't maybe bet on the Kentucky Derby before, which factors should they be considering that are specific to Churchill Downs? Yeah. Um, some people like to say that, that Churchill Downs is a surface that horses who have run here before usually and have done well do well here. Uh, I think Belmont is a lot like that. So getting to know the different tracks if you can uh, and understanding – the conditions around those, I guess, if, if any of those tracks kind of have that bias, if you will, um, is important. But, you know, here it's just in this situation, it's can anybody beat tis the law? <laughs> and if so, <laughs> you know, how are you going to get that? Or even if you're playing like exactas or whatever it is that you're playing, who are you going to use underneath uh, in this field of 18 horses that we have? So I, I don't know. It's uh, this race in particular is one of those where I'm kind of relying on my eye and, and, and you're going to look at the class of the past performances of horses to see who might be able to, to follow it up. But here at Churchill Downs, you know, distance is important, obviously. Usually this is the race the first time that three-year-old horses ever go a mile and a quarter in their lives. So there's a lot of factors that, one, the distance that they have to cover, and two, the roaring crowd that you have here. Well, for one, we don't have a crowd because we don't have, <laughs> have any fans. But two, some of these horses have already run a mile and a quarter, including Tis the Law, which gives him that much more credibility as the favorite. So you got to try to think, you know, which horses can handle the, the really big track, really big turns and, and the long distance that we have at Churchill. Excellent. How about the timing of the Derby? Obviously, it's usually supposed to be in May with COVID. It's in September. Is there a, like a weather factor that you're thinking about? <laughs> I was nervous about it because living here for quite a few years in college, I mean, it can be very, very hot around this time of year. Uh, but same thing goes in, in Derby, uh, in May, rather, for the Derby. It can be hot then, too. Hopefully, we've had a lot of rain so far this week, uh, but I think the forecast is supposed to be pretty good for Oaks and Derby Day. So fingers crossed. We'll see. <laughs> it's rained the past couple of years. In fact, I think the last time that there was sunshine was 2015 when American Pharaoh won every other year since then. There's been uh, quite a bit of rain, so I'm a little sick and tired of wearing like my raincoat outfit. I'd like to have like a nice dress and a fascinator and, you know, like nice shoes to wear. <laughs> that hasn't been the case of, of late, but uh, hopefully the rain will, will hold off there. But I think it's more so just the timing for the horses. I mean, trainers peak these athletes at certain points of the year and with everything that got shut down earlier you know, in March and all that, there were some racetracks that just closed completely. These horses had nowhere to run and, and they want to run every day. They're just, they are ready to go. Think of any gym rat that, you know, like if they skip a day, you don't want to be around them. So, <laughs> um, you know, it, it was hard for these trainers to peak these horses at the right time and to move around their schedule too. Uh, and now, especially you've had maybe some horses that have had more races uh, leading up to the Kentucky Derby than they would have if it was in May, which for some, is a positive if they were slower developers maybe they were a late foal as we call them born later in the spring um it could be on the the beneficial side but for other horses they you know may have kind of lost some of that form that they had going into the early part of their three-year-old year so it really just depends on the individual but it's, it's certainly going to make it interesting yeah, absolutely. Just a, a lot of factors to consider there, and it, it adds a little bit of additional uncertainty. And we're going to talk about Tis the Law here in just one second. But first, they did the draw for the posts on yeah. Tuesday. And as someone who knows very little about <laughs> horse racing, I don't know what that does. Like, I don't know the impact of that. Uh, so just broadly, what impact does that have? And were there any horses whose opinion you, you had changed as a result of the draw? Yes, yes and yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it, typically, one thing you have to know is that this year, for the very first time ever, they're actually using a gate that has 20 stalls. It's one gate with 20 stalls. In years past, they have had two gates. They've had the main gate that they use here at Churchill Downs and the auxiliary gate. And the reason why that is important is because there's a little bit of like a, a, a gap between the stalls where the two gates meet in the middle. And also it had to be pushed over a bit. Um, so the horse in the one hole was basically screwed because if you're staring out the gate of the one hole, uh, the one stall in, in, in the gate, you were staring at the rail. You had to oh. take a right and then get straight to go forward. So it was a really big disadvantage for the horse that drew all the way on the inside 
uh, because they had to be a speed horse. You have no choice in that way but to get up and go, get out of the way, get your positioning because you're going to hit that rail. So now as we have this 20 horse gate, the one hole I think is actually, it ends up being where the three post was in the other gate. Uh, I read an interview that that had been talking about it. I haven't actually walked through it myself yet. I'm hoping to do that later, but uh, <laughs> but we'll see. But so now we don't have that factor. But also um, the post positions for some of these horses are really important. Like Authentic, for example, is in all the way on the outside. In fact, the top three favorites, I think, are all the way on the outside, 15 or 16, 17 and 18. But Authentic is a horse that's previously had some issues at the starting gate. So I forget if it was two races back. I think it was two races back. He actually broke to the outside. So horses have to always turn left. He broke and went right. <laughs> oh. So he had to do a lot of extra work to, to hustle up and get back in touch with the field, get competitive positioning. So the one concern with a horse like that is now he's all the way on the outside, way out there in hole number 18. And if he does that again, if he's up to his old quirks, that's really going to hurt him in the long run. Now, at least at Derby, they have the long stretch of Churchill Downs to get that position before they go into the first turn. So maybe that will help him. And, and uh, he's got Johnny Velasquez aboard, who's a very strong rider, a Hall of Famer rider. So we're hoping that he doesn't do that again. But it is a little bit of a concern, one, just being so wide, but two, the antics that he's shown before. Awesome. So Tisla won the Belmont and the Traveler Stakes and is... Uh... Is a pretty heavy favorite at four to five. Um, are those five, I think, short? even shorter. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Keeps on short. Sure. <laughs> what, what What is your take on on the favorite and maybe a dog that can uh, pull off the upset? Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't know about dog racing, but as far as horses go, uh, <laughs> I think this is is definitely a valid favorite. He's done everything right so far. I think you have to give him a lot of credit as well that he's been able to sustain this long of a campaign. So, like I was saying earlier, you know, he's had to really be very specific with the races that he's going in, the training, peaking at the right time. And also, again, he's the only horse that's won at this distance of a mile and a quarter, which is really tough to do. I mean, that is a classic distance. Horses run that and, and may never run that distance again after the Kentucky Derby. So it's not something that we commonly see. So it is a bit of a specialist type. Um, so the fact that he's already been successful over it, albeit at another racetrack, I think does give him a, a lot of credit and he's just been training like a monster. But, you know, again, this has been a, a longer year for him. So it's also very possible that maybe he's a little tired after all of that and you might want to look towards a new shooter. But that's, I think, just the the wishful gambler in me, um, the, yeah. the degenerate hoping for a little bit more of a price. But <laughs> I don't know. He, he's definitely a valid favorite. And, and I think the way you're probably going to have to do it is key him in some bets and then try to get some value underneath if you can. And who are you keying in on as far as horses you might turn to if you're going to pair them with Tizla? Which ones stand out as being values outside of that? Sure. I think the second and third favorites are, are definitely in, included in the conversation. And that is Authentic, who, you know, he, I just don't know what he's going to do. It's really interesting because I've actually spoken to quite a few of the connections with my company, Vidhorse. We produce a lot of the content for some of his owners, um, my racehorse and Spencer farm. So even the breeder of authentic said from the beginning, when he was a baby, he was a little bit immature mentally. And I feel like that's still been the case as he's grown up into an adult. So I, I think we still will see him continue to get better as time goes on. But, um, for now, I, I'm really hoping that he's on his A game as we're looking for Saturday. And the fact that he has broken from the gate before and, you know, done what he's done gives me a little bit of pause. But I still think he's an absolutely gorgeous horse as long as he can keep his mind on the task at hand because he's gotten a little distracted in the past and I just need him to focus. Um, and then Honor AP, it's, it's been a little bit of a, uh, a rivalry between those two horses in California. Um, Authentic was doing a little better and then Honor AP was able to beat him in a race in which Authentic had a really not so great trip um, and then I think Authentic came back and won the Haskell after that so he's proven himself again but also Money Mike Smith Hall of Famer of course a great jockey has chosen to stay with Honor AP so do you read into that as well and think well I mean he rode both horses Authentic and Honor AP he went with Honor AP maybe you give that horse a little bit more of a look um, and he has looked fantastic over the track. I mean, his, his stride is just absolutely massive. He covers so, so much ground and he's a, a gorgeous looking almost black horse with a lot of white on him as well. So he's very flashy. Um, so those two horses are absolutely included in the conversation, but I mean, what's the Derby if not without a long shot, you have to play a long <laughs> shot, right? Um, so for a few of those, I think King Guillermo has been a little bit of the buzz horse here and he's so, 
he's so obscure in so many ways because he comes from a little bit of a, I guess, a lower tier track, if you will, uh, where he's had his big races before. None of his connections really speak very much English. Victor Martinez is the the owner of him, and uh, he's, they've just been so excited to be here and so blessed. And so he's been exciting because he's actually performed really well on the racetrack. He's been here for a couple of weeks now. He's been running. He's uh, uh, working out over the, the track. And so he's got the local works and he's been like putting in times that are unbelievable. He's so strong. The rider can barely hold him back. So I'm hoping he didn't peak like a couple of weeks ago as he's been doing that. Um, <laughs> but he's one that'll be a big price for you. And I think Max player is at way too big of a price on the morning line and on enforcement rate uh, or enforceable rather has uh, impressed me too. So those horses I'm, I'm kind of looking at and continuing to make my opinion on as we go throughout the week. But if you're looking for a couple of long shots, I mean, why not throw a few bucks down across right. the board on some of those? Yeah, King Guillermo is 20 to 1 at uh, TVG Authentic. 10 to 1 Honor AP is 11 to 2. Megan, like, let's say we have a listener out there who's just looking to place one bet. They want to bet one bet on a winner. Where would you go? Would you go tis the law? Are you going with the favorite? Or based on the odds, are you going to go for one of those longer horses you were just talking about? Oh, man. I mean, do they want to make any money or do they just want to cash a ticket? Like, Do they just want to win? Say they Let's want make to... some money. Let's make them some money. <laughs> uh, if we're going to make them some money, I, I think you got to go with Honor AP. Okay. I ha- I've, I've changed my opinion on that, too. My, on my podcast, uh, The Horse Racing Happy Hour, I've kind of besmirched Honor AP a little bit as we've gone along. But now seeing him in person, I'm like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I think I might actually like him. So the guys are going to give me a hard time about that because I've swapped sides now. But um, well, but it's I, not bad to swap cool. sides if you are doing so because you got additional information. Like we should always be willing to change our opinions if we get additional information, and that's what you've yeah. gotten here. The one, one thing though that's really difficult in horse racing, and I think you guys kind of touched on this before, is like what angles do you use when you're handicapping races? Well, usually I have kind of the same foundational tools that I will use when I'm looking at a race, but with races like this, like the Kentucky Derby, any of the triple crown races, the Breeders' Cup races, I I think you can't help but be like, well, but maybe if this happens and you kind of go outside of your, you know, what you know and your initial gut feeling, what you use every single day when I'm covering these races on TVG. And that can be, that can be a little bit detrimental sometimes because it's just like information overload and you end up going in different directions. Whereas if you would have just stuck to your handicapping that you had done all along in the first place, you, you, you know, probably would have done better, but I don't know. It can go either way. It's, it's really a 50, 50 split on that, but it is something to keep in mind, go with your gut instinct. And I mean, even for people that are just casual fans, if you like a name, you like a color, you like a jockey, <laughs> whatever. Because beginner's luck, very much like at the blackjack table, it exists in horse racing. Okay. <laughs> so take a shot. <laughs> so one last question before we let you go here. Are there any other things you could see in the next couple of days that could influence the way you're viewing things? Is there additional information you're still seeking out that may dictate the way you view things for Saturday? Yeah, I think um, the way that horses continue to handle the racetrack, like this morning it was a little bit rainy, so it was tough to really get a good gauge on how they are traveling over the surface. So when it dries out and you can see what the surface might look like a little bit more uh, as it will in the afternoon when we run the actual race will be helpful. But there also are some that have shipped in Uh, We're over the track for the first time and are a little bit intimidated by the big size of this track. There's a lot for them to look at. It's all different. It's all new. Um, And so I'd like to see those horses, any of those that kind of show signs of being a little bit antsy, they have to calm down and really, you know, get their game faces on as we move forward. And of course, any equipment changes, if a horse uh, is running off in the mornings and, you know, maybe does a little too much, it's very, very particular. We're trying to peak these horses. So there's a lot of stress for for these horsemen around it, the trainers, the jockeys, et cetera, owners. Um, but I'll be looking for hopefully, you know, nothing goes wrong with anybody, even in just the slightest way. Uh, and obviously looking for the comfort level of some of the horses that are a little more keyed up, <coughs> authentic, uh, to, <laughs> you know, be a bit better as they go around the track. Well, that is Megan Devine. Make sure you find her on Twitter at Megan Devine TV. Also check her out on TVG and in the Horse Racing Happy Hour podcast. Megan, have fun this Thank weekend. You. I know I will, like that can get lost in it, like, but just have some fun. And we appreciate you uh, taking time to talk to us today. Absolutely. Anytime. Good luck, guys. Thank you. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Megan Devine for swinging by live from Churchill Downs to get us set for the 2020 Kentucky Derby. Once again, a link to her podcast. The Horse Racing Happy Hour is in the show notes over on numberfire.com. You can also just search it on Google and check her out on TVG as well on Twitter at Megan Devine. And Ed, 
you're a runner, so I feel like Megan's analogy about how horses are like runners probably, you know, related to you pretty well. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely something I can relate to. I run, but I'm not a, I'm not a miler anymore by any stretch, <laughs> but I do enjoy watching professional milers. And, you know, these guys are all fast and have a lot of endurance more than probably anyone listening to this show, you know, and, and me. More than and, me. And, what's that? More than me. I can guarantee you yeah. that. But but there's a lot of differences, right? So the world record holder, Hisham El Garouj, like he was always a strength runner, right? So he would start picking up the pace 600 meters out. Um, yeah, 600 meters out. Where a lot of other guys, um, you know, in these championship races, a lot of times, like, you know, a lot of people wait and sit and kick. And so those are like the speed runners. Um, I think I mistakenly said during the show, like someone who's going to come up at the end and, and try yeah. to outsprint everyone. Uh, is going to be one that's going to be more reliant on speed. Someone who's going to go a little bit earlier is, is a little bit more reliant on strength. So, um, yeah, I think that makes it a little bit more interesting to me. Uh, I like watching races, and, yeah. and there's no reason it can't be a horse instead of a, a human being. Absolutely. If I'm going to go all out for NASCAR, I might as well go all out for horse racing too. And uh, exactly. I, I always try to watch the Derby just because like it is. I find it very interesting. But like we said with Megan, I know nothing about any of this stuff. So, like, right. it's nice to hear someone who very much knows what they're talking about explain it to me in a way that I can actually understand. So, uh, definitely appreciate Megan putting things in terms that I can understand and uh, a good conversation. Hopefully, you can uh, have some fun betting that. You can go to TVG, bet it right there, have some fun with that. You can find Megan there as well. So, big thank you once again to Megan. Let's move into covering the future and Ed. The pick report, is it out publicly? I've consumed it, so I don't know if I got a little sneak peek, <laughs> but is it available publicly? Or yeah, are it's we... out. Okay, okay. Out. You, can, you can grab it at thepowerrank.info. It's a URL that will take you to a place where you can grab it. Uh, it's got a PDF, got an audio file, and got a data file, which is where all the value is because that's has all the data on, on NFL quarterbacks for the season and, and who you can expect to you know, be more or less turnover prone. And uh, well, I was ex- I was excited because, like, you you not only gave, like, the application – I'm not going to give away all the details of it, obviously, but, like, you gave the, 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 the math analysis of it, but then also related it directly to 2020 in ways that validated my priors that I've always felt kind of shameful of. <laughs> like, I always feel like I've been too low on Carson Wentz. I don't know, like – if you compare me to Philly people, Philly people are very weird about Carson Wentz, so I don't know where I compare relative to them. But, like, I always was lower on Carson Wentz in consensus, and your numbers were interesting on him. Um, yeah. So I'm not going to give away the details of the pick report, but what did you want to discuss today for covering the future based on that research? Well, I am I am going to give away some details okay. of the pick report <laughs> because uh, cause I think it's pretty interesting. So Carson Wentz has been up and down in his NFL career. You know, the former number two pick was brilliant in 2017. It was his second year in the league. He led the Eagles to an 11 and two start before he got injured. Uh, Nick Foles finished the job as as the Eagles won the Super Bowl. The Eagles' offense hasn't been as good since. It's been a little bit more of a struggle, and in particular, 2019 was pretty difficult uh, as Wentz had to deal with a lot of receiver injuries and finally got knocked out, unfortunately, in that playoff game. But despite these struggles, the one thing Carson Wentz has been really good at is interception prevention. So the last three years, the average NFL interception rate has been 2.4%. And Wentz has been better every year. In 2017, he was at 1.6%. 2018, he was 1.7%. 2019 was 1.1%. The question is whether this is going to continue. Well, we really can't make any definitive statements based on his pass interception rate. So when you for NFL quarterbacks, last year's interception rate only explains about 7% of the variance in interception rate this year. So it's just not sticky from year to year. So to do a better job predicting interceptions, you need to dig deeper into the data. And the important statistic you need to look at is, is passes defended. So in the NFL play-by-play, they're on an incomplete pass, there's a defender there. And this defender has either gotten his hand on a ball, so maybe it's a lineman that sticks his hand up, or maybe it's a, a defensive back that gets his hand on the ball. And these plays also include when a defender hits a receiver and jars the ball loose. So, so basically, uh, these are plays in which the, the quarterback is putting the ball in a dangerous situation. So for Wentz, this is the most important fact. A quarterback that puts balls 
in dangerous positions, the more he does that, the more likely he is to throw interceptions. Okay. So uh, interceptions happen on about 21% of uh, bad balls. So that's like interceptions plus passes defended. And the key thing is that this rate, this rate of picks to bad balls, it regresses strongly the mean every year. Like it's not sticky at all. There is zero correlation from year to year. And this is really bad for Carson Wentz. So in 2019, about 10.5% of his dangerous balls ended up as interceptions, right? So that's how he was at 1.1%. And, you know, the Eagles weren't exactly lighting it on fire. It, it, anyway, so you're going to see very strong regression to the mean. Uh, that number should be very closer to 20%. The data suggests he's going to throw a lot more picks in 2020. Um, is this the reason to go Eagles under nine wins? I, I, yeah, I haven't, I haven't pulled the trigger yet, but like, uh, there's a lot of things pointing, uh, in that direction. I think it's going to be a tough season, uh, for Carson Wentz. I always try to look for things that kind of support, uh, what the data says. Uh, when you, when we talked earlier this morning and you, you expressed your, you know, your, uh, your lack of faith in Wentz, uh, th that was something that I took to support this analysis, Shil Kapadia has covered the Eagles for the Athletic. He writes, uh, uh, he does, he covers the entire NFL now. But in his Eagles preview this year, he wrote about, you know, Wentz is never going to be the most accurate quarterback. I think that's also consistent with this analysis. Uh, he does tend to put a reasonable number of balls in dangerous positions. Um, it's certainly not terrible. You know, he's not like Jameis Winston, but. The rate at which he puts balls in bad positions is about NFL average, which means you don't expect to see such a great interception rate heading forward. And I think the thing that's interesting here is whenever you talk about Carson Wentz, and this is, it depends on who you're talking to, but most people will talk about the wide receiver injuries. And that's justified because sure. the receiver injuries were very important last year. However, it's not just the, 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 the luck that he had on the bad balls like you were alluding to, but also... They faced a really easy schedule from a pass defense perspective. Like Carson Wentz, his overall efficiency numbers were not good, but that was despite facing, I believe it was the second easiest schedule from a pass defense perspective in the entire league. This is based on weighted dropbacks. So like, you know, weighted dropbacks, it's pretty straightforward. I think that Sam Darnold is the only guy who had an easier schedule based on weighted dropbacks, um, which is also kind of scary when we're discussing Sam Darnold and the Jets. Uh, but Wentz face an easy schedule. So yes, he will eventually have Jalen Rager. Now Rager sounds like he's going to miss a couple of weeks. He has Deshaun Jackson. Alshon Jeffrey will eventually come back. But when you add in potential regression on the bad balls, you add in, I would assume, a tougher schedule for this year, despite the fact that Byron Jones is no longer in the NFC East. And you add in Andre Diller going down to left tackle. They put Jason Peters back there. There's no Brandon Brooks. Uh, Raggers hurt already. Alshon, as mentioned, is banged up. There are a lot of reasons to still be skeptical of Wentz, even though the wide receiver play should, in theory, be better than it was last year. So I I think some people are too harsh on Carson Wentz. Um, they will criticize him for, like, non-football reasons, like based on really weird reports. Uh, but I think that there are legitimate football reasons to still be skeptical of this team, despite the fact that their receivers just kind of inherently have to be better than what they were last year. Yeah, and, and he tends to, to fumble on sacks more than the average NFL quarterback, too. Yeah, that does so, not help. <laughs> so that was actually part of the journey. I was actually digging pretty hard into fumbles on sacks for a while. Yeah. Um, and uh, the research didn't go like I really wanted it to. Um, so anyways, a story for another day. And so then I got into the interception stuff, and I was really happy with the way that turned out. But I was actually talking to Shiel, and yeah. he was like, oh, yeah, he's really bad with fumbles, too. And I was like, oh, well, let me look at that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so in, in terms of turnover prevention, it, it could be a very rough year for, for Carson Wentz. Yeah, uh, Shiel Kapati was just on uh, Robert Mays' podcast. He has a uh, podcast over at the, the Athletic now, and they were talking about the NFC East. So uh, if you want more information on that, I'd check that out. But also check out the pick report over at the Power Rank. Now posted, Ed, it was a great listen. I definitely appreciate you letting me check that out. But uh, it's a worthwhile endeavor for people who want to better understand regression and better understand predictiveness in stats that can sometimes be pretty hard to predict. For my covering the future, I'm going to talk about baseball, because basically every time we have discussed baseball on this podcast, 
I've been talking up the Chicago White Sox, and right now they're tied for first in the AL Central, so feeling good about that. They were like plus 340 to win the AL Central like two weeks ago, but I also think now is a good time to get a piece of the Minnesota Twins, given where markets currently stand. The Twins are one and a half games out in the AL Central. They're behind both Chicago and Cleveland, and a part of that is, like you predicted, their offense regressed in a major way the past few weeks. That cluster luck was no longer in their favor for a bit in that stretch. But injuries also played a massive role in the Twins' downturn. They've had all of Josh Donaldson, Mitch Garver, Byron Buxton, Jake Odorizzi, Rich Hill, and Homer Bailey all miss time due to injuries this year. That is 33% of their starting lineup and 60% of their starting rotation. Buxton came back last night, got a couple of well-hit hits. Uh, Donaldson is supposed to return tonight, and that's not just good for the offense. Like, Buxton on offense could go either way. Donaldson should be good for offense, but both Buxton and Donaldson are elite-level defensive players as well. The starting rotation is still going to be an issue because Hill doesn't seem totally right. Odorizzi and Bailey are still going to be hurt for a bit, but the pitching has been good even with those guys barely playing so far this year. They are ninth in all of baseball in skill interactive ERA for the active roster. They are fourth among American League teams, and now they get Buxton and Donaldson back, and the defensive number is not accounted for in skill interactive ERA. So now they're getting healthier. I would expect the performance for the Twins to tick back up here. They are currently plus 750 to to win the American League pennant. With the new playoff system, Fangraphs still has the Twins making the playoffs 94.8% of the time. They have them winning the World Series 6.2% of the time and 13.4% to win the American League. And the implied odds at plus 750 are 11.8%. So a little bit of value there. But I think even beyond that, if they can get those starters back, things could look even better. Keep Donaldson healthy. Keep Buxton healthy. The upside in this team is pretty good. So although the White Sox have been my team from a betting perspective this year, I do think this is a prime opportunity to buy up some stock of the Minnesota Twins at plus 750 to win the American League this year. Ed, what are your numbers saying about the slumping Minnesota Twins? Well, I'm kind of mad at them because I had (laughs) a lot of bets on them against Detroit, who I still don't think is a very good baseball team. Uh, The weekend, and that didn't really work out like I would have liked. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, Minnesota, you know, when you just look at this year's day, they're kind of near the middle of the pack. Obviously the injuries are, uh, you know, a big part of that. Uh, it's interesting to see the White Sox are, are very much near the top of the pack. Um, third, when you look at, uh, base runs or expected runs, uh, adjusted for who you've played, uh, behind, I mean, the Dodgers are first, which is not particularly surprising. San Diego is actually second. So, which is surprising, uh, Tampa Bay fourth. So, um, yeah, I know. I'll be interested to see what happens with the twins. I mean, I definitely think, you know, when you, you know, I mean, I don't really have a great way for adjusting for injuries. I'm not sure right. that's why they lost to the Tigers, uh, over this series. I think the Tigers just probably played some of the best baseball of the year. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm excited to see where that division heads going forward. Whenever the twins don't play well, it's because of Byron Buxton not being in the lineup. That is my, <laughs> my definitive theory as this devout, hopeless, lost fanboy of Byron Buxton is that if they didn't play well and he wasn't in the lineup, correlation causation, baby. We're just cashing it out right there. there. My lone like regret with the White Sox is that I didn't do anything beyond the division bets. I have Yohan Moncada to win MVP. That's probably not going to happen, but I wish I had gone a little bit harder with them. But we'll still take it. So I get to I get to be happy as a Twins fan if the Twins win. I get to be happy as a financial person if the White Sox win. So uh, hedging the bets for sure. That is all the time that we have for today here on Covering the Spread. Big thank you once again to Megan Devine for swinging by and breaking down the 2020 Kentucky Derby. Once again, if you want to bet that, check out TVG. Find Megan on Twitter at Megan Devine TV and check out uh, her work on TVG and also on the Horse Racing Happy Hour podcast. Ed, uh, what is going on for you? Uh, mostly, I'm assuming just kind of been slammed. Are you like sleeping yeah. now with the pick report being out? <laughs> yeah, it's mostly the pick report. Uh, you can check it out at the powerrank.info. That's a URL that will take you to a place where you can check out the description and 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 purchase it. Um, yeah, it's been pretty hectic the last uh, the last week just getting everything together. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not the longest report in the world, but it also does have ten figures in it, which I which I really think do uh, uh, kind of make the report just to see everything visually and how different right. things are. 
Um, there's actually uh, my favorite one is there's a figure about the distribution of players in terms of skill versus luck for free throw shooting yeah. in the NBA. And, and, and this is something in which there's like literally no luck yeah. at all. And the, and the distribution is starkly different from perhaps like uh, the distribution of NFL quarterbacks. When you look at like interceptions uh, divided by dangerous passes, uh, which yeah. I talked about a little bit earlier. So, which is is looks, you know, very Gaussian, and it, there's very little skill in that. So, um, anyways, there's a ton of figures in there. That's what I've been doing. Uh, I'll have something different to talk about next week. Well, get some sleep, uh, get some rest, and uh, hope people go to thepowerrank.info to check out the pick report. Also, find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. I am at Jim Sonnes, J I M S A N N E S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for running the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Good luck if you're betting the Kentucky Derby this weekend over at TVG or whatever else you may be betting whether it be the nba playoffs nfl week one next week college football this weekend it's a good time to be a sports fan we'll talk to you all again next week this has been covering the spread right here on the fan duo podcast network <laughs>